Hello and welcome to lecture 10, where we'll be talking about digital baseband communication. Now this lecture used to be called Pulse Modulation, but I renamed it Digital Baseband Communication to make it explicitly clear what we're talking about. So Pulse Modulation is a form of digital or mostly digital communication and we use the term baseband to distinguish it from band pass or wireless communication. So this is our lecture today. Pulse modulation or digital baseband communication. So last week we spoke about the process of digitization and that will allow us to talk about the remaining three lectures about digital communications, baseband, band pass, and multiplexing. So when we say digital modulation, that's code for band pass digital modulation or digital communication. So we should now be familiar with the terms sampling and quantization. This is old news to you. We spoke about anti-aliasing filters and we spoke about quantization, quantization error. We also spoke about non-linear quantization and the idea of compounding. Today we're going to talk, or we're going to start the journey of digital communications. So we can have digital baseband, digital band pass and multiplexing. So we've almost finished. We've got three lectures to go. Today's lecture and two more. Now, today's lecture isn't particularly long. You can see it's 31 slides, but it's really important. We're going to be talking about pulse modulation as a form of baseband modulation. So now we have our data. It's been sampled and quantized. It's encoded. It's in digital form. Now that's assuming that it was originally in analog form. It needed to be sampled, quantized and encoded. If it was originally in digital form, then all, all that's necessary is for it to be prepared for transmission. Now this transmission can either take place via cables, so all these different types of cables that we've seen before, or it could happen wirelessly. OK, so this is what we call baseband communication because generally there's no carrier. And this is band pass communication. It's wireless and there's generally a high frequency carrier. So these are two very distinct types of communication. You might think this is modern communication and this is old communication, but that isn't the case. Each of these has their distinct areas of application, their advantages, their disadvantages, their limitations, and we're going to be looking at some of those today. So we'll be talking about pulse modulation, pulse code modulation, line coding, and we'll introduce the idea of channel capacity. So a few questions for you. Have you ever wondered what we mean by the backbone of the internet? What's the internet actually made of? How do all the computers around the world communicate? Why are there so many cables in an internet data center? So you've seen, you must have seen images and videos of the Microsoft and Google data centers around the world. Why are there so many cables? Why isn't everything wireless by now? Why are there cables under the sea? Why isn't everything wireless via satellite? Plus, what limits the speed of an internet connection? How fast can a connection be and what, in, what, what limits it? Is it the frequency? Is it the bandwidth? Is it the wavelength? Is it 
something else. I have a couple of videos that I've um, put together into one that I'll present for you. The links to the original videos are available on the actual PowerPoint. But I invite you to watch this little video. It's only a few minutes long, but it's really useful. There was a question about this in the um, 2020 final exam. Okay, I think it was worth 10 marks. So it is something that uh, I do take seriously, and it's a short little video, so I invite you to watch that. We never stop hearing about how the internet's in the cloud, but really, it's in the ocean. About 300 undersea fiber optic cables are responsible for 99% of international data traffic. It's basically the same way we connect to each other in a single country, except underwater instead of underground. They transmit PewDiePie from Europe to America, and they connect stock traders in New York and London. And these cables, placed by private companies, are the backbone of the internet. But if you held one in your hand, it'd be no bigger than a soda can. There are just a few layers of protection from the water, including petroleum jelly. Yes, your internet is covered in Vaseline. They're uh, vulnerable to earthquakes. At least a few times, confused sharks have bitten them. But many cables are beneath sea life, because in some places they go as deep underwater as Mount Everest is high. Ships lower a plow that digs a tiny groove in the ocean floor, lay in the cable, and it's naturally buried by sand, thanks to the ocean's current. In that process, it's both stunningly simple and mind-blowingly complex, is responsible for making the internet a truly global network. It's an idea that's audacious and crazy, and you think it has to be cutting edge, and it is. Today, over 99% of all international internet traffic is routed through a network of over 420 submarine cables in service, stretching over 700,000 miles around the world. This is equivalent to wrapping a single cable over 28 times around the Earth's equator. This vast network of cables provides the underlying infrastructure to the internet's high bandwidth highways. These cables use optical fiber to provide average data transmission rates of 35 terabits per second, which is crazy because just over five years ago, the average data rate was only nine terabits per second, which equates to nearly a four times increase. Some of the newer and most cutting edge cables, such as the Maria cable, which in Spanish stands for high tide, are even faster. This cable, which is owned and funded by Microsoft and Facebook, connects Virginia Beach, Virginia in the United States to Bilbao, Spain, and is capable of data transmission rates of up to 160 terabits per second. This is the equivalent of streaming 71 million HD videos at the same time, and it is 16 million times faster than the average home internet connection. The makeup and production of these cables is also extremely important. Submarine cables are typically thick in size, with most being 3 to 4 inches in diameter, while the actual wire the internet runs across is typically no thicker than a human hair. This is because the majority of the cable's purpose is strictly for protection. The process of laying the cable is equally as important as the production of the cable. The laying of the cable is performed by a special trawler ship that is capable of carrying giant spools of internet cables and unreeling them as it passes from shore to shore. The first step to laying the cable requires an extensive survey be performed at the sea floor to map the route for which the cable will be laid. After being loaded onto a ship's hull in large spools, the reels will be unwound as the ship travels along the mapped route. A sea plow is towed along the back of the ship as well to aid in burying the cable a few inches below the surface for added protection. At the end of the installation process, extensive testing and inspection of the cable is performed before the cable is put into service. Now you may be wondering when this vast network of undersea cables began. Surprisingly enough, the first undersea cable was laid over 177 years ago all the way back in 1842 when Samuel Morse, the developer of Morse code and commercial telegraphy, decided to submerge a cable insulated with tarred hemp and india rubber in the waters of New York Harbor to run a telegraph through it. After a successful experiment, it wasn't long after this in 1858 when the first transatlantic telegraph cable was laid between the United States and Great Britain. This connection with endpoints in Newfoundland and Ireland allowed communication between the transatlantic shipping companies to go from a matter of weeks to just a matter of minutes. The demand for internet capacity is only set to increase as new consumers and industrial devices turn online over the next few decades. 
Most projections place half of the world's population as internet users by next year in 2020. Historically, bandwidth capacity, connectivity, and low latency have all been the drivers behind the construction of undersea cables. By the year 2022, there are 35 new cables slated to be turned online in order to handle the increased traffic demands from some of the largest companies such as Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, all of which combined are responsible for nearly 70% of all internet traffic. Although there are opportunities for satellites to serve more disadvantaged areas of the world where physical links are not practical or possible, undersea cables will continue to remain the backbone of the internet for decades to come. So you might remember this slide from the previous lecture. And I said we'll, we'll be looking at it in more detail uh, in today's lecture. So you're familiar with this block here, sampling, where we have analog signal, we have some analog message, and it's sampled. So you're familiar with that bit. And then we quantize it. The output of the quantizer will be digital information, but we'll need to encode that into a series of ones and zeros. But we still need to do something to that before it's ready to actually transmit as a waveform, a baseband signal on the actual medium, on the actual uh, cable. That is the process of pulse modulation. So we call it baseband, <coughs> excuse me, communication, because there's no high frequency carrier. So even though we call it modulation, it's modulation between inverted commas because it isn't real modulation in the true sense of the word where we have a high frequency carrier. So there's no carrier involved. <coughs> Excuse me. So, once we have our analog signal and it's been digitized into a series of digital symbols and it's been encoded into ones and zeros, getting these ones and zeros into a series of pulses, that's what we call pulse modulation. And there are different ways of doing this. So, we have the simplest way, pulse amplitude modulation, where the amplitude of the pulse is proportional to the amplitude of the data. Now, I was going to say the digital data, but it's possible to have, and it's actually rather common, for pulse amplitude modulation, and indeed um, all of these modulation schemes well, pulse amplitude uh, and pulse width and pulse position. These can all be analog. Okay, they can be digital and they can be analog. In today's lecture, we're assuming everything is analog, is digital, because we're doing digital band pass commun baseband communication. But it's possible that um, the amplitude of your pulse is actually analog. So it, it, it could happen after sampling, but before quantization. So if the amplitude of the pulse is proportional to your message or to your sample, that's called pulse amplitude modulation, PAM. And if the um, width if the pulse here is proportional to the amplitude of your sample, then we call that pulse width modulation. Or the position of your pulse compared to the start of your period could be proportional to the amplitude. So we have pulse width modulation and pulse position. Pulse position. <coughs> 
modulation. But most common and most important for today's lecture is what we call pulse code modulation, PCM. This is what most digital communication consists of and this is what we're interested in where each sample each sample is broken down into n bits each sample is represented using n bits so that sample is that n bits this sample is the next set of n bits okay this is called pulse code modulation and it's what forms most data communication traffic on fiber optic cables so taking a simple sine wave as our analog example that's then sampled using a sampler and then quantized so together that's ADC sampling and quantization that's digitization you sample at a rate of fs samples per second and you quantize into l levels or n bits and we can say l is 2 to the power n the number of levels is 2 to the power the number of bits we then encode that and this digital data, that's what we use for our pulse code modulation. So how many bits are we generating per second? Well, we mentioned this last week. It's the product of the number of bits per sample and the number of samples per second. So both the sample rate and the bit depth determine the data rate. So let's call this the data rate. This is how many bits we're generating per second. So, question. If we had 16 levels, so L is 16. The question is, how many bits per sample are needed? So how much is N? So we, we know L is 2 to the power N. That means n is log l to the base 2. So in this case, it'll be log 16 to the base 2, which is just 4. So we need 4 bits per sample. Every sample requires 4 bits. So if we knew the sample rate, we could just multiply that to find the data rate. So, we looked at this bit a second ago. Now, putting this into the entire PCM system flowchart, what we have before the sampler is your analog message. We have a low-pass filter. Why do we have a low-pass filter? This is to make sure that we have a band limited signal to band limit your original signal you can think of this as an anti-aliasing filter because it, by band limiting our analog signal we're preventing the sampler from undersampling okay so it, we band limit our signal using a low pass filter, which is a form of anti aliasing filter. Now, after encoding, we then launch our pulses onto the channel. And remember, this is where the signal is most vulnerable to the effects of channel degradation. So, this is where noise, distortion, and interference happen. There's also attenuation. 
all of this happens on the channel. So what do we do to, to avoid these effects? There's something called a regenerative repeater, and you might have seen pictures of these in the video I played. So I'll show you in a second what that looks like. But the regenerative repeater sort of recreates these pulses after they've been corrupted by noise. They're recreated and transmitted on to our regeneration circuit, ready for decoding reconstruction. Remember, a sampler always has to have a reconstruction filter to recover the original message. So you've got analog message at the input, analog message at the output. The sampler requires a reconstruction filter. So you've got the transmitter at one end, the receiver at the other end, and the channel in between. Just like the block diagram we looked at in lecture one. So this is the repeater I spoke about. And it's a screenshot from the YouTube video. So this is your under C cable there. And this thing here is a repeater. So what does that do? It takes your signal that's been attenuated and affected by interference, noise, and distortion. And by setting a threshold and by sampling it can determine whether a point is below or above the threshold and then it can reconstruct a fresh signal so it's as if the noise has been removed but the noise hasn't actually been removed it's effectively been removed because we've recreated the signal. So it's as if the signal's brand new. And we did that just by um, sampling and applying a threshold. It's a good process, but it's not perfect. Okay, so these repeaters, every 50 miles or maybe 80 kilometers along a cable, they'll have one of these. And the process of that, or the purpose of that, is to recreate or regenerate the signals. So if you have the, several of these along a cable, you can minimize the effect of distortion, noise, degradation, attenuation. So we've spoken about uh, PCM, we've spoken about um, uh, the uh, data rate and sample rate, but what we haven't spoken about yet is the bandwidth. So if we're sampling at a particular sample rate and we have a particular bit depth, if we multiply the two, that gives us the bit rate, okay, or the data rate. Now, if it's possible to squeeze two bits per second into every cycle per second, so that's your bandwidth efficiency. If we can get two bits per second into every hertz, then the bandwidth of your PCM signal is half that data rate. So your data rate divided by two is the minimum bandwidth for the PCM. So if you've got a data rate of 100,000 bits per second, you'll need at least half of that, so 50 kilohertz of bandwidth. Okay, and that, that's, that's important, and you'll see, you'll see that in a minute. So, an example. If we sample at 10 kilohertz, so that's your sample rate, and we have 16 levels, in our quantizer, so that's L. The question is, how many bits per second are needed? So what's the data rate? What's the bit rate? So remember we said the data rate is simply Fs times N. 
so it's fs times log 2 of l. So here n is simply log 2 of 16, which is 4. So we simply multiply 10 times 4. So it's 40 kilohertz, or 40 kilobits per second. So the unit is bits per second. So this is a true or false question. We're given a signal with 16 levels and a signal with 32 levels. And we're saying, will the first require half the bandwidth of the second? Now remember we said the bandwidth or the minimum bandwidth is fs times n divided by 2. So they say assuming the same sample rate, it means that the bandwidth is proportional to the bit depth. So if you double the bit depth, you'll double the bandwidth. If you half the bit depth, you'll half the bandwidth. So are we halving the bit rate here, or the bit depth? So if L equals 16, N is log 16, which is 4. But for 32, N is log 32, which is 5. Now, even though 16 is half 32, 4 is not half of 5. So the bandwidth, which is proportional to n, will be a factor of 4 over 5, or 5 over 4, but not um, half. Okay, so this is false. So the bandwidth for the 16 will probably be four-fifths of the bandwidth for 32, but not half. Almost the same question again. This time we have 16 levels and 17 levels. And it's asking, will it be twice the bandwidth? Well. Remember we said the bandwidth is proportional to the bit depth. Now, 17 levels, n is log 2 of 17. But that's not going to give you an integer. So what you need is the next highest integer, which is going to be 5. And for the 16, you've got log 2 of 16, which is 4. So again, it's not twice. It's a factor of 5 over 4. So it's false. So we've spoken about um, sampling, quantization, digital encoding, pulse modulation, pulse code modulation. And we always spoke about pulses as if we knew what they looked like. But now we're going to talk about something called line coding, which is actually what the pulses actually look like. How do we design the pulses? What kind of pulses do we use for a 1 and for a 0? Now we could have a whole lecture about this. I've chosen to summarize it into one slide and not to go into too much detail about that, just so that we can focus on other things such as bandwidth and channel capacity. And there are many, many different line coding formats. Okay, I will introduce you to a few, and you can read up on many others in your own time. So, the simplest way of thinking of a 1 and a 0 is 0 is going to have no voltage, and 1 is going to have a high voltage, whatever that high might be. Now, notice 
we have something called unipolar and something called bipolar. In a unipolar signal, we have either a zero at zero volts or a one at some high level. So there's only two levels. Whereas in a bipolar signal, we have a high level, positive, and a low level, negative. And we have a zero level. We also have something called return to zero and non-return to zero. So we have RZ, return to zero, and we have NRZ, non-return to zero. And what that refers to is within the one bit period, does the signal return to zero? So here it's zero for a whole bit period, and here it's one for a whole bit period. One for a whole bit period, and then zero for a whole bit period. Whereas in a return to zero scenario, if it's unipolar, you'll have zero for the duration of the bit period, but for a one, it's one for some fraction of the bit period, let's say half the bit period, and then it returns to zero for the remainder of the bit period. Again, for the next one, it's one, and then it returns to zero for the next bit period, or the next half of the bit period. Here we have a zero for the entire bit period, and again we have a one, then it returns to zero. Then we have a zero, followed by a zero, and then a one that returns to zero. So that's what we mean by a return to zero. Okay, and you can think of some of the advantages and disadvantages of these different line coding formats. You can think of which ones contain synchronization data within them. Which of these data formats is most wasteful of power? Okay, so you can think about where we would use return to zero and where we would use non-return to zero. So these are some things for you to think about, for you to read about, but I won't go into too much detail about them. What I will speak about is something called the bandwidth requirements, something called bandwidth efficiency. So a few minutes ago when we spoke about pulse code modulation, we said, I'll remind you, I said, if it's possible to squeeze two bits per second into every hertz or every cycle per second, where is it? Here. We said if it's possible to, to fit two bits per second into every cycle per second, that'll give us a minimum bandwidth for our PCM. And I said this was something called bandwidth efficiency. But now we understand what this means. That in a non-return to zero scenario, we can transmit two bits per level change. That means two bits per second per hertz. As opposed to a return to zero scenario, where we can only transmit one bit per level change. That means one bit per second per hertz. So imagine a non-return to zero scenario where you have a one followed by a zero. Imagine, you can imagine that one sine wave would be enough to encode that information. Whereas if we needed to return to zero within the one bit period, the frequency of the sine wave you would need to represent that would be twice that. So within every hertz, within every one unit of bandwidth, for non-return to zero, we can represent two bits. 
whereas for return to zero, we can only encode one bit. This is probably one of the hardest slides to actually understand and visualize, so I encourage you to take some time to try to understand what that means. So the number of bits per second per hertz is what we refer to as the bandwidth efficiency. All you need to know is the difference between non-return to zero and return to zero for this module. So we've almost finished. A quick recap of the mathematical expressions. So remember we said if we're quantizing using L levels, then the number of bits is simply log L. Why do we use these brackets here? This is called the ceiling function. It means the next highest integer. So if I were to, if we had something like 3.1, that would give us 4. Okay, the next highest integer means, so if n is 3.1, that means 3 isn't enough. You would need the next highest integer, which would be 4. So it's called the ceiling function. So sample rate, inversely proportional to the sample period. The number of bits per second, that's just another way of saying n fs okay but i've written it like this because sometimes this is what you'll have this is what what will be given to you and therefore the bandwidth of using a bandwidth efficiency of two for non-return to zero we can find the minimum bandwidth for pcm is simply the product of um this this divided by 2. So it's simply n fs over 2. And that's what we've already um, looked at a few slides before. And strictly speaking, this bracket should look like that. So it's the ceiling function rather than just square brackets. Okay, we've almost finished final few things we need to talk about is how fast can we send data down a channel. So when you have your cable, your baseband communication channel, how fast can you squeeze data down that channel? You have this channel, how fast can you squeeze data through it? That's really important. That's basically what almost all communications comes down to. The question is always, how fast can I communicate and how accurately can I communicate? So what limits the rate at which one can communicate? Now, there are several things which limit it, but in general, it's the slowest link. We call that the, the bottleneck of our communication system. So if you've got two parties and they're communicating and there are several blocks... There are several different components in this communication system. You might have wired communication followed by wireless communication and then more wireless communication and then wired communication and then wireless communication here. You might have several links. You might have an infrared link, a Bluetooth link, a wireless link, a satellite link and a cable link. What determines the speed of the overall connection is the weakest link, the slowest link. That's what we call the bottleneck. That's what's going to slow everything down. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you've got 100 megabits per second here and 500 megabits per second here and 40 megabits per second here and 70 megabits per second here. If you've got a 3 megabit per second connection here, that will slow everything down. It means everything will be working at 30, at 3 megabit. Okay, so the bottleneck will determine the rate at which we communicate.
but there's something else which also determines how fast we, commu- com- we can communicate. Or, another way of putting it, is this three, where did that come from? Who decided that three? Well, it turns out that is sometimes beyond our control. That's called the channel capacity. The channel capacity, capacity is the maximum speed at which a channel can transmit data. And that's determined by a couple of things. And we spoke about this all the way back in our second lecture, probably. We introduced this idea of signal-to-noise ratio. And I said, the signal-to-noise ratio determines how fast we can communicate. So this is something called the Harley-Shannon law. So the Harley-Shannon law says that the rate at which we can communicate, the theoretical channel capacity, for a channel that's corrupted by white additive Gaussian noise is a product of the bandwidth B and the logarithm to the base 2 of 1 plus the signal to noise ratio. Okay, so the higher the bandwidth, the higher the channel capacity. The greater the signal to noise ratio, the higher the channel capacity. And as simple as that. Example, let's say we wanted to transmit at that rate. And we had a channel that allowed a a signal-to-noise ratio of 70 decibels. And the question is, what bandwidth is needed? So what value of B will allow us to communicate at this rate? So you want to transmit it. 2.3 2.3 megabits per second, well, that's your channel capacity. We want to find B, so we need to find the signal-to-noise ratio. So if we know that the signal-to-noise ratio is 70 dB, then we need to actually find the ratio as a ratio, i.e., without units. So when calculating decibels, it's almost always 20 log 10, except when we're dealing with power, in which case it's 10 log S over N. So S over N for 70 decibels is 10 to the power 7, 10 million. So we've got this expression here, rearrange, and you can find the bandwidth of 100 kilohertz. So, you might have initially guessed, well, if we needed 2.3 megabits per second, we would need a bandwidth of 2.3 megahertz. But no, it's not that easy. It's not that straightforward. It depends on the signal-to-noise ratio. If you have a good signal-to-noise ratio, like 70 decibels, then 100 kilohertz is enough to support 2.3 megabits per second. A few things to watch out for. We use log to the base 10 when converting to um, and from decibels, but in the Shannon-Harley law, we always use log 2. Okay, so just make sure you don't confuse those. There's a couple more examples, but to keep the lecture short, I will not go through this example. These examples are solved um, in the pencast section, i.e. in the problem sheet. The answer is right here, but how to get from these numbers to that is really straightforward, and I go through it in the pencast section. There's one final example. You know, many of you won't even remember what a fax machine even looks like, but it's a good example, nevertheless, of how using a 
um, fairly noisy telephone line with a very limited bandwidth, what determines how fast these, um, these pages actually come out of the fax machine? So it all comes down to this thing called channel capacity. So that's it for today's lecture. We've introduced um, baseband digital communications as a form of pulse modulation, or should I say pulse modulation as a form of digital baseband communication. We mentioned different pulse formats. We focused our attention on pulse code modulation. We spoke about different line coding formats and we introduced the idea of channel capacity. We also spent some time talking about uh, the internet backbone and why baseband communication and cable communication is so important. And it all comes down to this idea of channel capacity and the idea of bottlenecks. Okay, so lots of things to think about. Next week, we will look at the other type of digital communication, and that's band pass modulation. And by band pass, i.e., we're talking about carrier modulation, i.e., we're talking about wireless modulation. And really, it's very similar to what we've already spoken about. So it's AM and FM and PM once again, except this time for digital signals. Okay, I hope you found that helpful. So we've almost finished. We've literally got two lectures to go. The last lecture is just a mini lecture. It's like half a lecture. And our digital modulation really is our, our last substantial lecture. So make sure you're ready for the class test on the 12th of May. I hope you found that helpful. Until we meet again, stay home and stay safe.